Study Section 10 Paragraph Development Introduction We can describe a paragraph as a miniature composition. This is because the paragraph contains a proposition contained in the main or topic sentence which is developed throughout the paragraph. The point in the main sentence is supported by other sentences. Examples or illustrations are also presented before a concluding sentence rounds off the paragraph. Furthermore, such paragraph may be presented in a variety of ways to show how the author's mind is working. We would realize from a paragraph whether the author is making comparisons or contrasts, arguing for or against an idea, making analogies, etc. In this lecture, we shall explore the intricacies involved in writing good paragraphs and using different patterns of thought flow. Objectives At the end of this lecture, you should be able to 1. Write a good paragraph 2. Write different types of paragraphs and 3. Write paragraphs using different thought flow patterns. Pretest 1. What makes a paragraph unique? 2. What are the different forms of a paragraph? 3. What is a thought flow? In the last lecture, we examined briefly the components of a paragraph. These are the topic sentence and the supporting sentences. In this section, we shall look at certain features that are required for a paragraph to be considered acceptable. We also extend these to relationships between paragraphs that follow one another. Paragraph unity, coherence and cohesion. One, unity. Unity and coherence are two major features of a good paragraph. Unity entails the discussion of only one topic in a paragraph. It follows that a paragraph which discusses more than one topic lacks unity. This is easily seen when a writer rambles about in his or her discussions. 2. Coherence Coherence is closely related to unity in composition. The major idea in coherence is that there must be a logical presentation of ideas. This entails that the writer should discuss ideas in particular order that readers can follow. 3. Cohesion In cohesion, sentences in a paragraph must hang together. That is, each sentence must be connected to the preceding or the following ones in the same paragraph. Usually, writers use repetitions, synonyms, and prenominal reference to join sentences together in a paragraph. You can also use transitional linkers discussed below. First, while unity deals with the discussion of only one idea, and coherence deals with the logical presentation of connected ideas, cohesion deals with the hooking together of the sentences. Transitional words. Apart from the logical arrangement of ideas in individual paragraphs, it is also important to organize the paragraphs in a composition to make the idea in one lead naturally to another in the next paragraph. To achieve this goal, we use certain words called transitional words or paragraph linkers. These show the relationship of the new idea to the one already discussed. Such new idea may be an addition to or a reinforcement of the earlier point, a contrasting view to it, or a summarizing clue for the entire discussion. Each linker is used at the beginning of each new paragraph.
as a signpost to direct the thought of the reader towards that of the writer. These are for convenience broken into groups. 1. Additive linkers. These linkers present paragraphs which discuss points that are in accord with the previous ones. That is, they serve as a marker of additional information to that in the preceding paragraph. Examples include, in addition, besides, also, moreover, and furthermore, similarly, and again. 2. Contrasting linkers. These introduce paragraphs which give views opposed to that presented in the earlier paragraphs. Examples include, however, even though, conversely, although, despite the fact that, nevertheless, but, even then, on the other hand, on the contrary, and in contrast. 3. Temporal linkers. These indicate time relations in composition. Examples include after, before, then, now, meanwhile, in the meantime, and during the period. 4. Concluding linkers. These linkers are used to introduce paragraphs that conclude discussions or compositions. Examples are finally, hence, thus, therefore, in sum, to sum up, to conclude, in summary, consequently, and as a result. Another way of linking paragraphs is to take the major idea, one word or phrase from the last paragraph, and paraphrase or repeat it in the new paragraph. Such words or phrase are usually picked from the last sentence of the preceding paragraph. All these ensure that the paragraphs in a composition cohere. Types of paragraphs. Paragraphs are of different forms and types. This depends on the function they are performing in compositions. The following are some types of paragraphs. 1. The introductory paragraph. An introductory paragraph presents the main thrust of the composition. Usually, it prepares the reader for what to expect in the composition. Introductory paragraphs must be brief. They should serve as the background to other paragraphs in the composition. The tested statements must be distinct from but equal to the other topic sentences in the succeeding paragraphs. Consider the following example. We had been itching to visit the Olumiri waterfalls in Eriodo since our class teacher announced that we would go there on an excursion. The day was Tuesday. Every one of us had arrived in the school waiting for the bus that was to convey us. It arrived at 7.30 a.m and off we went. This is an introductory paragraph on the subject of excursion. The author carries the reader along by the tone of the paragraph. It sounds really exciting and the reader seems to be assured of a nice reading of the author's experiences at the Olumiri waterfalls. It prepares the reader for an account of the journey in a chronological order. Here is another example. There are three key words here which we have to define. Revisit, academic, and tradition. We have to define them not because we are ignorant of their meanings, but because it is useful for all of us to agree with what the rest of this exercise is all about. What is it to revisit? It is to take a second look at something and that second look may or may not be revisory. The Webster's Third New Dictionary defines the verb to revisit as to inspect or to check anew, 
to re-examine, to visit again, to return to. What we want to do today is to re-examine the foundations of the academic profession with a view to returning to it. Adebayo, GA, 2005, Revisiting the Academic Tradition, page 1. In this paragraph, the author has done two things. First, she has redefined the relevant terms in the title of her discussion, Revisit, Academic and Tradition. Second, she has noted that the whole discussion is about to re-examine the foundations of the academic profession with a view to returning to it. In essence, she has set the tone of her subject. She has educated the reader on the theme of her discussion. In this way, readers will remain focused and expectant of how the author would discuss her subject. Number two, the expository paragraph. The exposition or explanatory paragraph gives insight into what something is, what it does, how, why, and when it is done. Unlike the defining paragraph, it avoids giving specific meanings but provides guides to the intended interpretations of a concept. Consider this paragraph. It is not enough to part with your money and go to bed. The utilization and expected results should be closely monitored by you since your ultimate goal is to have a peaceful retirement. Therefore, you need to follow the progress of your investments as stockbrokers are human beings who could make mistakes. Monitoring will help you to know possible declaration of dividends or bonuses, dates, payment date and expected amount amount of shares in each security invested in, possible depletion in your investment due to any unauthorized transaction, price at which stocks were purchased, possible time to sell if need be, and calculation of investment margin. Ologun J.O. 2006 Facing Retirement with a Smile Page 6 in this paragraph, the author explains in simple words how an investor should monitor stocks but to derive the maximum benefit. The transitional paragraph. These serve as bridges between introductory or preceding paragraphs and succeeding ones. Although transitional words are also used to link paragraphs, some paragraphs are characteristically transitional. Such paragraphs ensure that the ideas in the composition hang together. They provide smoothness and continuity in the thought flow. Here is an example. So far, we have juxtaposed the two languages and drawn out conclusions from the exercise. What remains now? is the identification of problem areas and suggestions on how to overcome such problems and achieve perfection in English usage. Lamidi, MT, 1991, a constructive and error analysis of the written English of Hausa speakers, page 48. In this paragraph, the reader is reminded of what has been discussed and what should be expected at this stage. Number four, the concluding paragraph. The concluding paragraph usually occupies the final position in a composition. It rounds off what has been said in different ways. First, it can summarize the salient points in the composition drive home the points raised in earlier paragraphs and tie them to the same team. It can also contain your opinions on the earlier paragraphs. Concluding paragraphs also reinforce the strong impression you have created from the introduction through the body. Here's a sample. 
Today, awareness in the capital market is on the upbeat as it is the safest form of savings or investment. In view of the policy of government, federal, state, local, to privatize, the capital market will continue to receive the necessary attention. The market provides ample opportunity for discerning investors to expand the scope of their wealth creation ability. Therefore, your financial independence can easily be achieved through consistent and properly planned investments in shares. Ologun J.O. 2006 Facing Retirement with a Smile Page 12 In the earlier paragraphs, the author had discussed the concepts and functions of capital market. In this concluding paragraph, the author summarizes the advantages of the capital market and concludes by encouraging the audience to participate fully. Thought Flow Patterns Thought flow patterns refer to the way you organize your ideas in a paragraph. Apart from using topic sentences and supporting sentences, you still need some form of organization within the paragraph. This enables the reader to follow your line of thought. There are different types of thought patterns. These include cause and effect, classification, comparison and contrast, argument and persuasion, enumeration, analogy and definition. We take them one by one. Number one cause and effect. The cause and effect thought flow refers to a discussion of certain occurrences and the effects of such. It means that something impinges on the other and there are consequences of such contact. Number one, cause and effect. The cause and effect thought flow refers to a discussion of certain occurrences and the effects of such. It means that something impinges on the other and there are consequences of such contact. In using this method, you need to divide occurrences into classes to show their relatedness. Thus, when we see a cause, we should see the effect within the same paragraph. If for stylistic reasons you start with the effects, you must know the causes. This means that there should be a direct bearing between the cause or causes and its effects. Sometimes there are casual chains or chain effects. In this case, causes and effects occur in a sequence. An event causes an effect, which in turn also causes another effect. Again, events may overlap. You have to use your skill as a writer to make all events clear and show the relationships for readers to follow your discussion. To avoid confusion, you may have to identify immediate and remote causes and their effects. Finally, you may also want to distinguish between major and minor causes and effects. This has to be weighed in relation to the topic of your composition. Principally, cause and effect thought patterns are often used to explain or argue in several fields. In explaining, you need to present the events in order of occurrence and show the connections between the cause and its effect. In arguments, you need to show how a proposed action will be beneficial or not beneficial. You may also show why an explanation of causes is more accurate than another. Poverty and malnutrition are scourges of the population, which have become determinants of the quality of life 
of such populations where the number of those affected are high. The world began to know poverty, malnutrition, and disease when God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 17, God said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. That curse has made it impossible anywhere in the world to eradicate poverty, food insecurity, and sorrow. Akinyele Olaolua 2005 Poverty, Malnutrition, and the Public Health Dilemma of Disease Page 3 In this paragraph, it is the contention of the author that the remote cause of poverty and malnutrition were 1. God drove Adam and Eve away from the Garden of Eden and 2. God cursed them. Consequently, poverty and nutrition determine the quality of life of people in the world. These two serve as the immediate causes of human diseases and death. Number two, comparison and contrast. As the name suggests, comparison shows similarities between two or more items. Contrast, on the other hand, shows differences between them. This combined thought pattern is often used when items are to be compared to see which is beneficial or better. Thus, the major purpose of the thought flow is evaluation of subjects. The other function is to explain the similarities and differences between two subjects for pedagogical purposes. This will make the two similar subjects distinct to the reader. When you concentrate on comparison, you bring out the similarities, and when you focus on the contrast, you lay bare the differences. By using this method, you can establish a relationship between two objects. You may present your ideas in different ways. First, you present the differences in one paragraph and the similarities in another paragraph. Again, you may discuss the features that one has in one set and the features of the other in another set. In the alternative, the features of the two subjects may be discussed together. It is a matter of choice. Whichever option you choose, it is essential that you balance your argument. Do not emphasize the features of one to the detriment of the other. Consider the following example. In Fordrance of our thesis, we argue that there is a significant difference between the undergraduate and the professorial text. The first difference is that, as we have earlier indicated in this lecture, Emphasis is not on God and the supervisor, objectifying as the humane the characteristics of a supervision, but on the writer and the attempt to cover his or her life's cause. The second difference is that the professorial acknowledgement enjoy more name dropping of significant others than the undergraduate one, and this is much to be expected since the essay reveals more of the particular person and situations which are where morality of the discourse resides. The third difference is that unlike the undergraduate essays, which would give consideration to the contribution of their colleagues, not so much to the project or dissertation as to the success of the program, the professorial essays downplay the imputes of colleagues. Of course, 
life cause which the professors address does not have the same sense of a closed limited time of the undergraduate's program which ends with their course of study. The professor's life courses are ongoing and dynamic, extending beyond the inaugural lecture. It is less time and context bound. Importantly, colleagues are, for the professors, perceived within a hierarchical structure which is formal and prescriptive, but no corresponding structure exists for the undergraduates. In the long run, the two styles can be expected to show a remarkable sociological difference to serve as critic on each other. In the long run, the two styles can be expected to show a remarkable sociological difference to serve as critic on each other. Lawi OB 2006, The Undergraduates and Professors in a Shared Discourse, Inaugural and Acknowledgement as a Cultural Critique, page 19. When you look at this paragraph closely, you will realize that texts, acknowledgements produced by professors and undergraduates are being compared. The author takes the points one after the other. He provides his views on the professors vis-a-vis -vis the undergraduate's texts in each point before going to the next point. Notice that three points are made in the paragraph. These are 1. Unlike the undergraduate's acknowledgement essays, the emphasis of the professor's acknowledgement is not on God and the supervisor but on self-praise. Two, the professor acknowledges more people than does the undergraduate. Three, undergraduates acknowledge contributions of colleagues, but professors downplay colleagues' contributions. Number three, enumeration. In this third flow pattern, you have to show how parts, incidents, or concepts combined to give a whole picture. You may first introduce the topic and then list the subtopics to be discussed. You may also make a general statement and then go on to enumerate supporting details. Consider the following example. How do we measure quality? What are the parameters for measuring quality? According to the Commission on Colleges of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, measures to evaluate academic programs and general education may include the following. Standard tests, analysis of thesis and recitals, completion rates, results of admission tests for students applying to graduate or professional schools, job placement rates, Results of licensing examinations, evaluation by employers, follow-up studies of alumni, and performance of student transfers at receiving institutions. All aspects of the educational program must be clearly related to the purpose of the institution. Suggested parameters to measure quality have been divided into five broad groups namely academic content, management, physical facilities, equipment, and funding, or SASONA, O, 2005. Parameters for measuring quality in Olayinka AI and VO Adetimiri editions, pages 15 to 16. Looking at this paragraph, we see the large number of items that the author wants to discuss in his bid to measure quality in academic programs. Towards the end of the paragraph, he narrows these down to five broad topics, which are discussed in subsequent chapters.
Number four, classification. This method of thought flow is characterized by sorting out the strands that make a whole. In using this method, you should present the topic sentence with the classes you want to discuss. Each of the parts mentioned in the topic sentence can then be discussed with supporting sentences. In science-related disciplines, it may be necessary for you to present diagrams, charts, or pictures to make things clearer. There are four types of child marriage. The first is promise remarriage, which is arranged before or after a girl is born. The second is a form of marriage in which a girl child is placed in the custody of bonding of her in-laws from the age of 10. The girl child continues to grow up in the family until she's mature and ready for formal betrothal. Sex between her and the prospective spouse is usually not allowed until the girl child is mature enough. The third type takes place during early adolescence and can therefore be described as early adolescent marriage involving girl children between 10 and 12. The girl child is formally betrothed at this age and she begins childbearing right away. Finally, there is the late adolescent marriage that takes place when a girl child is between 15 and 19 years. Childbearing and rearing follows immediately. Erin Osho Lai, 2005, The Burden of Our Women, page 6. In this paragraph, the author started with a topic sentence, which indicates the categories of marriage to be discussed. Subsequent sentences identify these one after the other, providing details where necessary. Notice that this differs from enumeration thought flow. While enumeration thought flow lists items to be discussed, classification thought flow explains the different categories. Number five, analogy. This pattern refers to a comparison of two very different items. For instance, reproduction between rats and humans. The analogy is used as a metaphor to show the features two dissimilar things have in common. It may also be used to present unfamiliar concepts and ideas by referring to a familiar feature shared by the two. Notice that analogies differ from comparison because analogies discuss subjects from different classes while comparison contrast discusses subjects from the same class. Analogy focuses on one subject but comparison uses two. Analogies use the second subject only to elucidate the features of the main subject. Note also that the two subjects must have some fundamental feature in common before you can draw any analogy. Otherwise, you might be drawing a false analogy. Here are two paragraphs, the second of which uses analogy. Again, in the spirit of the lecture, it is my belief that the three legs of the tripod, literature, medicine, and politics, are equally important. I will therefore not attempt to elevate one above the other as it happened in an incident recorded several years ago. According to that story, three men, a doctor, a writer, and a politician, got shipwrecked during a violent storm on the sea. Unfortunately, there was only one life jacket. An argument ensued on who should use the life jacket. 
The doctor insisted that as the only one in the boat with the skill to keep people alive, he should have the life jacket. However, the writer, who claimed to be the chronicler of memory, men and events, begged to be allowed to do just that in case his other two companions perished in the storm. After a long argument, the politician suggested that in the true spirit of democracy, the matter should be put to vote. And so, the three men cast their votes. The politician who had supervised the election announced the result. The doctor had one vote, the writer had one vote, while the politician had four votes. Orquet du Wale, 2005, Reflections on the Engaging Tripod of Literature, Medicine, and Politics, page 1 to 2. The first paragraph starts at the middle. It is included for you to know what items are being discussed. The second paragraph uses analogy thought flow. Notice that literature, medicine, and politics have nothing to do with three people being shipwrecked at a sea. The only analogy the author is drawing is that there is competition among three equal concepts, just as there was among three professionals in the analogy. Number six, definition. This thought flow pattern explains the ramifications of a concept, an emotion, a value, or an idea. There are three kinds of definition. The first is a formal definition, which is equal to the ordinary meaning or specialized meaning of concepts offered in a dictionary. It is used to explain the basic meaning of terms or expressions which may confuse the reader. The second is a stipulative definition. This presents the author's special view of a particular concept. It shows the author's peculiar interpretation of the word in the context of the composition. The third type is an extended definition. This type is used for a full exploration of the meaning of a concept and drawing boundaries around it. It attempts a precise and complete realization of the meanings of a theme, a quality or an idea which people may misunderstand or disagree with. Generally, therefore, definitions involve the use of synonyms saying what a word does not mean and tracing the history of particular concepts which are in focus. Here is an example. Malnutrition is a state where adequate nutrients are not delivered to the cells to provide the substance for optimal functioning. It is also a state where more nutrients than the cells needs are consumed creating excesses which become injurious to the cell. There are approximately 45 nutrients which are required by the body for its functioning and these must be supplied in the daily diet. Many of these are micronutrients required in small amount. Akinyele or Laulua 2005 Poverty malnutrition and the public health dilemma of disease page 9 this paragraph offers readers a definition of malnutrition this is a formal definition as it provides the ordinary meaning of the term argument and persuasion as the term suggests Arguments have to do with advancing facts to make readers reason along with you. 
Persuasion, on the other hand, involves using subtle means such as emotion and values. This thought flow pattern is used when a topic is debatable. Thus, you need to express a proposition or make an assertion presenting your own line of argument. Inherent in this pattern are appeals. These are ethical appeal and emotional appeal. You need to appeal to readers' beliefs, social ties, values, feelings, and concrete evidence to support your position. Notice that you should have the appropriate mixture of reason and emotion to achieve the desired effect. Facts are not to be proved with argument. You have to appeal to reason. Values may be subjective. You may have to apply emotion and reason. As academicians, students and investors, knowledge of the capital market is indeed indispensable given the fact that the first financial market is a major driver of economic development. Nigeria must give the market the needed attention and prominence. Our developmental needs are many, but as a nation, we have been greatly favored by the Almighty God with an abundance of resources, human and natural. The capital market can play a pivotal role in developing these resources. The capital market was the engine of growth in Western economies where the market pulled in funds for the development of vital infrastructure such as roads, bridges, ETC, and is still very much promoting development. The potentials of the Nigerian capital market are enormous and can do for Nigeria what the market did for the United States and other countries. The support and participation of every one of us is, however, critical. Nanusa Sulaiman, the capital market as an alternative source of funds, the role of the Securities and Exchange Commission, pages 24 to 25. In this paragraph, the author gave reasons why people should participate fully in the capital market trading. 1. The capital market can enhance a nation's development. 2. The capital market assisted the Western economies to grow. He then lays the premises for the conclusion. 1. We have abundant material and natural resources. 2. Capital markets can also make Nigeria grow. And finally, he concludes, therefore, everyone must participate in the capital market trading.